that better? It's recorded. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Daddy to Know Jesus Lesson 80. We are finishing up book six tonight. We are on page 165 to 176. That's lesson 80. The Bible text is on pages 166 and 167, and the lesson notes are on pages 168 to 173, and when we complete this lesson, we will be halfway through the life and teachings of Jesus. But we're going to talk tonight about Jesus judges adultery and sinful motives, uh, and uh, our subtitle is I Am Ashamed. In our timeline, we've already discussed I need to move this arrow and make it look bigger because we're somewhere the past the Passover coming down into the specialized ministry of Jesus just a short time before his crucifixion. When was the last time you engaged in a conversation of criticizing somebody because of some wrong behavior they had engaged in? Or maybe even some wrong behavior you think they may have engaged in. How often times have you criticized somebody for something that you think they did, only to find out later on they didn't do it? Oh, I've done that quite often. Oh, yes. Guilty as charged. I don't want to admit it, but... Were they in the room, or did you do it behind their back? Now it's starting to rub a little salt in the wound here, isn't it? They overheard. Did you realize that you were guilty of wrong behavior and give them some mercy or grace, or did you heap condemnation on them, wishing God would bring His judgment and vengeance on them? We're in John chapter 7, verse 53, into chapter 8, verse 20 of John's Gospel. Notice that John is the only one that is covering these events right now. And so we're... Uh, uh, only get, he's the only one that, that covered this, so he, we're only getting his perspective. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all doing other things. We'll get back to them soon. The Feast of the Tabernacles draws to a close, and the Pharisees find a woman who is engaged in adultery. And they bring her to Jesus to challenge him to judge her. Hmm. So let's talk about, <coughs> I'm so ashamed. First of all, the woman did wrong. Uh, Matthew, John chapter 7 verse 53 the last verse then each went to his own home but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives so he's in Jerusalem area at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus teacher this woman was caught in the act of adultery and the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Where's the guy? Yeah, We're going to get there. Don't yeah, I thought that was interesting. Not, it is interesting. Yeah, that, that way. As you can see bad. here, the Pharisees <laughs> are opposing Jesus. And they're going to come out as a group. Most of the Pharisees are going to come out in greater and greater opposition to Jesus. And they stand together with one another, so they think they're you know, it's a bunch, like a, a bunch of bullies picking up on one little, uh, uh, of course, Jesus is stronger than all those bullies, so I don't know if I can make quite that analogy. <laughs> but you know, when you get an army of you, you, you're emboldened, as opposed to when you're standing alone, or just a few with you. So these Pharisees want to discredit Jesus, so they happen to know that this woman is an adulteress. I know. And they bring her to Jesus, and they challenge Jesus to judge her. Now regardless of what Jesus did, they're going to twist the truth to make, it, make him either against the law of Moses, for which they'll condemn him against all the Jews for being against the law of Moses, or he's against the Roman law. And if that's the case, they'll then go to Pilate or Herod or, and, and they'll tell on him and get him in trouble with the Romans. So this is kind of like a trap situation. Oh, we have you ever had those times when you try to engage somebody and you think you've set a trap for them and somehow they weasel out? <laughs> I mean, 
If you've ever been in debates, Richard, I know you've been in debates with people and they were expert debaters. They had their arguments down really good. They could just turn you up, tip you upside down, twist you around, and before you knew what, you were lost and humiliated and shamed. Most of us, if we've ever tried to speak up for Jesus if, uh, with an atheist or uh, uh, somebody that just wanted to be combative verbally, you can get yourself in a real pickle. It's not hard. <laughs> and unless you just got some real sharp in you, uh, it can be really frustrating. Uh, reading David Wormbrand's Tortured for Christ. And, and it's interesting that the atheist would come on him and, and most of those situations, he was able to give them an answer and then turn it back on them. So that, that's exciting when we can find answers to that. But these Pharisees are... Now, uh, let me take a disqualifier here. I say these Pharisees, we have to recognize that not all Pharisees were against Jesus. Nicodemus wasn't. And we're going to find out here at the end of the Getting to Know Jesus series that Joseph of Arimathea right. was not against Jesus. And they both were Pharisees. So not we, we have to be careful when we group people into stereotype classifications. Not all of those in that group necessarily fit that classification. Not all attorneys are liars. Not all doctors are quacks. Not all ministers are hypocrites. One can spoil a whole bunch and make it bad for the rest of us. And so sometimes we, we have to be very careful in qualifying our labels. Accusing somebody of something, if you don't have concrete proof, can become a very harmful, hurtful and embarrassing thing. Well, let's go on here. Have you ever done something that you were very ashamed to have made public about you? Everybody say yes. 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 I knew we were going to say that. <laughs> have to say it too. How much did it hurt when your actions were first exposed to family and friends? I can think of some things. Man, I wish this would just die and go away. I wish it never happened in the first place, but I can't undo that it's happened. But they don't have to keep reminding me of it. And there are some things in our past which we wish we didn't have to be reminded. And once in a while, something will happen that will remind you of it. It hurts. You can use this to identify with how this woman felt in getting caught having sex outside of marriage and knowing that the penalty under the Mosaic Law was stoning if she got caught. Now, it, it's a sad commentary on us when we don't think about something being wrong until after we get caught. But that has become the mentality of today. And to a certain degree, it's not anything new. It's always been that way. Some people know better, but a lot of people think, well, I'm getting away with it. I'm getting away with it. I got away with it last time. I can get away with it this time. I got away with it last time. I'm going to get away with it this time. Uh, what do you mean? I'm under arrest. But I got away with it before. I guess I didn't get away with it after all. I got caught. We have all gotten caught. <coughs> Excuse me. This only emphasizes that we need to build a close relationship with Jesus in order to learn and recognize temptation and say no before that temptation becomes sin in our lives. And I very strongly believe the Bible teaches us that we're never tempted beyond our strength. So if we're really focusing on obeying and following Jesus, we can recognize temptation and say no to it without sinning. Uh, Morty? I think this also teaches that it's not the idea of getting caught but it's the idea of go and sin no more. It's the better idea of not sinning in the first place. Well, if you, but if you have, listen to the admonition of Jesus, go and sin no more. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous will say you're always an alcoholic, but you don't have to be a practicing alcoholic. You can be one who hasn't had a drink in... 
That's why they go by years. They start off with 24 mm -hmm. hours and they go up to mm -hmm. 35 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you can say, I've been free for X many years, people will plod with you and they will congratulate you and say, well, that's great. Well, let's go on. The accusers also did wrong. Not just the woman, but the accusers. Now, what do you say, the Pharisees say to Jesus? They were accusing this, uh, using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and rode on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, <coughs> until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. So Jesus knows the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and he puts their question right back on them. He accuses them of being guilty of sin in their own lives that would justify their being stoned. As you brought up, where is the man... Or is it the men who had had adultery with this woman? Why weren't they being brought before Jesus? The Mosaic law didn't say the woman should be stoned. It said they should be stoned. Hmm. So interesting how we want to interpret the law the way we want to apply it, whether that's the way it is intended or not. As a result of Jesus' challenge, all of the accusers leave knowing that they are just as sinful as the woman they are accusing. All have sinned in some ways as bad as, as how this woman has been caught doing. Now maybe they have not, maybe, maybe there's some of them that haven't committed adultery. But maybe they've cheated on their taxes. Or they've defrauded a customer. Or they've sinned in some other way that if you were going to apply the Mosaic Law, the way the Mosaic Law should be applied, maybe they said, Corban, to their parents, and said, I'm not going to take care of you, I want to keep my money for myself. That disobedient, rebellious child. What did the Mosaic Law say to do with a disobedient, rebellious child? Stone them. Stone <laughs> there was any one of a number of things that they possibly could have done. And maybe they did. Maybe there was one or two of them that hadn't had sex outside of marriage or, or uh, violated some major stonable event in the Mosaic Law, but they still knew that they were sinners Glenn. and that they were wrong in bringing this woman to Jesus for judging. You have a question. When Jesus said to them, if there's any among you without sin, let him cast the first stone, was he appealing to them as religious leaders or was he appealing to their humanity? What do you think? I would say it's appealing to their humanity, but as religious leaders, it compounds the infraction. If a member in the church commits adultery, it's bad. And you say shame on you. If a minister or a leader in the church commits adultery, it's no worse. But because that person is in a position of leadership, and supposedly teaching and knowing better, and we could think of some radio or TV uh, personalities, uh, Christian, uh, that have engaged in such a thing and brought great shame on themselves and on their respective ministries because of this one, one indiscretion. Some of them it was repeated indiscretion, they finally got caught. Hey, I got away with it a long time before. Oops, somebody just exposed me. Now I'm not getting away with it anymore. And I have to, they, they, they have to bear the shame. I just have to get on my knees and praise God that to this day, I haven't done some of those things. Because I think I could be just as vulnerable as anyone else. So, scary. We who are Christians and forgiven by the grace of God through the sacrifice of Jesus, often allow ourselves to get caught up judging someone else because of some sinful behavior in their life. And we don't take always take into account, that we, we, we tend to forget that we are sinners also, and oftentimes guilty of the same thing, or maybe even something worse. Have you ever been guilty of saying to somebody, that's wrong, 
and they come back and say, you did it. Uh-huh. Uh, I think I shared before, when I was about 16 years old, I, did I have a driver's license yet or not? Uh, I think I, my learner's permit. And I was working on the farm with my brother-in-law, and they had a long drive from the house down to the highway, and it was an open field. I mean, you could see a long ways. And so he went right on past that stop sign, onto the highway, turned into town, and went on home. And a little bit later, I was driving with my sister and came up to the same intersection and did the same thing. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, he did it. <laughs> I wasn't there when she talked with him, but next time he and I were in the car and we got to that stop, I didn't there. I stopped. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. We had a situation in Indiana where I'm not going to say the town, but this in Indiana, and a guy had just been brought to Christ, and one of the guys that was mentoring him was an elder, and they worked in the same factory, and he noticed the elder, and listening, he didn't pay much attention to the elder before, but now he's a Christian, now he pays attention. The elder was blankety blank this and blankety blank that and saying all kinds of bad things in, in, in the factory. So that Sunday, when the, this is true, so that Sunday they went to church, and the new convert came up in the, in the uh, vestibule or the entry and greeted him and said, well, how are you, blankety blank blank, good to see you, blank blank. He said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm just following your example. <laughs> that would uh, yeah, that's the truth. bring some repentance. Yeah, so, yeah. You're a leader in the church and you're custom like the world and somebody you want to Christ thinks, well, he's doing it. I, it hurts me. I can think of some things that I have said and or done in the past, uh, maybe not publicly, but around somebody who was influenced by what I said or did. And it hurts. It hurts. Unfortunately, there's a pastor here in Lakeland whose name was in the paper today or yesterday for misusing church funds to the tune of five thousand dollars. That hurts. That hurts. That yes. Hurts. That hurts. Sometimes we forget that we are sinners also, and oftentimes guilty of the same thing, or sometimes something even worse than what we're putting on that other person and blaming them for. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't judge other people. I'm going to get into that in just a minute, but before I go there, okay, uh, Jim, you want to say something, then we'll go on. For 10 years, I, I was in charge of the fact I developed the service there in the park, Vesper services. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> my song leader was from the New Hope Baptist Church, and my organist or pianist was from the same church. And there were others that went to the church. That was the New Hope Baptist Church. That's the church that you just referred to, Mongo, the church that I attended on the Sunday nights. I'd go there because of, the, of, the, of them supporting me in my work. So scary. And it's interesting that here he yeah, took, so scary. how much was it? Uh, $5,000. Over, over $5,000. Yeah, it was over. Oh, over. Oh, Fortunately, it was not like $500,000. We had to. Uh, I figure he's going to go to help me in a thief. He might as well take it off with $5 million. Uh, well, we had a church secretary in California, the church that we were attending, that made off with over 200000 over a couple of years' time. And uh, spent a year in jail for a $200,000 theft. We'll talk about that later. But, but getting back to the task here, before judging someone else, you must examine your own present life. Now, if we go back to examining our past, none of us are going to be qualified. Amen. But Jesus changes people's lives by changing their hearts. And what we did in the past doesn't mean that's what we're doing now or what we're going to do in the future. If you love Jesus and He's working in your life, you're not going to want to do those things that you did in the past. And so you need to examine, well, am I living right before Jesus now? <laughs> And if that is the case, then go to the sinner in a spirit of love and try to help them instead of just getting around others 
behind their back and condemning them. Our tendency, it's so easy to talk about somebody behind our back. But if they were sitting in the room, would you be talking about them that way? Even if they were guilty, there would be some who would. But it would be more appropriate to go to them in private and talk to them. Well, let's go on a little further. Here's our menorah. Uh, carved some in stone somewhere in Jerusalem by courtesy of Roar Productions. And uh, that's all I can tell you about it. <laughs> Here's the good news. We're going to turn the corner now. The woman caught in adultery had done bad, and she knew it. The Pharisees that were trying to accuse her had done bad, and they found out about it. But Jesus forgives repentant hearts. Oops, let's go back there. Let's read this. John chapter uh, 8, verses 10 and 11. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. After all the accusers have left, Jesus confronts the woman with a chance to change her life for the better. That's what Jesus does. He gave each and every one of us an opportunity to change our lives for the better. And I can guarantee you that there was something in your life, something in my life, something in everybody's life that needs to be changed for the better. He instructs her to stop her sinful behavior. Now this is mercy and grace in action. By the Mosaic law, yeah, she should be stoned. And probably uh, most of, or many of, if not most of, the accusers that were there with her. And, and they kind of realized that. They realized that they were sinners in just bringing her in and condemning her without bringing the guy in and, and without judging her uh, 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 by their own standards or judging themselves by the same standards. If you go back to Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, it says, Judge not lest you be judged because the law by which you judge is the law by which you're going to be judged. And so these guys are saying, by the Mosaical law, this woman is guilty of death. What do you say? And by the Roman law, she is guilty of sin. Uh, what do you say? And Jesus... <laughs> I like watching Jesus operate. I just do. I huh? wonder what he wrote. Their names, I, what I they wonder... Done. Everybody wants to know, what did he write on the ground? Did he write their names and their sins? Or was he just scribbling... Just doodling? Uh, was he... We have, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out. I think it's more doodling. Yeah, because they wouldn't have been convicted. They were convicted, and whether they could read what he wrote, or they just had curiosity about no, what he wrote. Them for doodling themselves. But notice most of all that Jesus doesn't condemn the woman. He can tell by how she's acting that she already feels very ashamed enough for her actions without further ridicule. Sometimes you know that person feels guilty enough. They do not need to have it rubbed in anymore. Jim? If this woman was caught in the act of adultery, they brought her to Christ, what happened to the man? That's the question. Another that's always, question that hasn't been answered. Well, they went away. They hid their head. The, either right. the men were all there and had to drop their stones and walk away. Yeah, because they probably were guilty. Or the man was excused because they didn't care about trapping him. They just wanted the woman to trap Jesus. Concerning the contextual agreement of the Scripture, it makes no difference what happened to the man when he was dealing with the woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... In that culture and time, people looked down upon a woman. She could not take her 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 own. Yeah, side women had less, and so, and so forth. But if they brought the man, the man would have been guilty. They didn't expose the man; they exposed the woman who was already cast down. Yeah. Maybe the man would have been allowed to make a defense for himself. Could be. You know, that's another thing. How many times have you accused a person without hearing their side of the story yeah. to find out? If, we, we've been through a situation recently like that that we're still dealing with. Uh, accusations were made, but only one side of the story was told. When you heard the other side of the story, the accusations may or may not be accurate, but 
But there's always two sides to every story, and you cannot make a fair judgment until you've heard both sides. Yeah. Richard, do you want to say something? It's easy to talk, to, talk at the woman as being a tramp. That's mm -hmm. stood. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. It's always that way. It generally seems to be yeah, that way. Well, back to the point. So I think way today. Jesus yep. sees that this woman feels very ashamed for what she's done. I would imagine she she's holding her head down and she is just waiting to feel that first stone hit her. I can just imagine that. And maybe she didn't look up. And she kind of heard the stones dropping, but they're not nearby. Maybe she sensed that the crowd was dissipating. Whether she was watching or not, we don't know. But she looks up and there's nobody around to throw a stone at her. Jesus does start to tell her to stop the immorality. If you're confronting a person who's committed a sin, an act of, uh, an act of blatant sin, like a minister who embezzled money from his church, or church secretary, or whatever, and they are feeling the shame for their actions, what they need is your love and encouragement, more so than judgment and condemnation. I know for myself, the time I, the last time I got a, a traffic ticket from a police officer, I didn't need anybody to tell me I'd done wrong. I felt bad enough. Now, 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 maybe some people, everybody's different, and some people just really don't like to be bad. And a little bit of scolding could go a long ways. You don't like to be scolded. And that's the way I am. A little scolding really, really can takes me a long time to get over. The other people, you can scold them, it's kind of like, yeah, so what? And you kind of wonder if he did it. I guess you have to weigh each situation on itself. And, and you know what? We are uh, back to the situation of making judgments. All of this that we're talking about tonight requires making judgments. Is this a sin that needs to be confronted, or is this a sin that needs to be loved and compassionate? Okay, so you had a, 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 a bottle of alcohol. Uh, you drank a, a pint of whiskey or whatever it is. I don't know how that stuff goes. We need to love you and help you start over. Rather than just say, well, you've got her trash. You, you're an alcoholic all the time. Why don't you just go wall in some ditch somewhere until you die? Compassion. That's what we see Jesus doing here. He made a judgment. Lady, what you've been doing is wrong. Stop it. But... I'm going to give you a second chance. Oh, I thank God for His mercy and grace in being the God of second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and seventy times seven chances. Somewhere in there, hopefully, we will repent. When you feel guilty for something that you've done, do you want a lecture? You don't want a lecture, but you want to know that someone still believes that you can do good with your life. How many of these guys and gals that are in jail would be there if somebody had been in their life that could have encouraged them that if you do this, you can do good in your life? And you don't have to be that way. I'm not an expert on that. I'm just totally... Uh, Speculate. Sometimes that does no good because the priest, a while back, someone very close to me uh, said, Well, I like my life the way it is. I like to drink, I like to smoke, I like to take a drug now and then, uh, mm -hmm. I like to swear, I like to get out and run on the weekend and things. I like that kind of life. What's wrong with it? Mm -hmm. And all the words in the world. Some people. Uh, just like water on a duck's back. Some people you are not going to be able to persuade. Yeah. Evidence. Not everybody that heard Jesus' words were changed by them. And his words were everyone's like that. And he's right. Most Jesus was right on, and his words had such great power, but yet God giving us the freedom to choose, there were still some who would not come to Jesus, no matter what he said or did. And he knows who they are. Mm -hmm. 
So, having somebody come alongside you that can say, look, you made a mistake, but that's behind you now. What do you think you can do to correct it? How can we help you to never make that mistake again? That can be life-changing. Uh, we can talk about the parent, words that parents or others use on children. And you don't know, but while your words may be the very words that causes that child to do something great or to do something, or to do something terrible. And every one of us have had an influence on children. Every one of us have been influenced. I can think of some adults when I was a, growing up that, that I just really like this person because they believed in me and they tried to see the good in me. And then I've seen others that were uh, not as... Fortunately, I think I listened more to the ones that were affirming than the ones that were uh, judging. Well, let's go on. Jesus lights the way to right actions. John 8, verses 12 through 20. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now the Pharisees challenged him, here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. I am the Son of God. That's what he's saying. I stand with the Father who sent me, and in your own law it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. So here's my testimony, here's God's testimony. I am one who testifies for myself and my other witnesses, the Father who sent me. And then they ask him, where is your Father? You do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while he was in the temple area, near the place where the offerings were put, Yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Wow! Oh, if I could have just half of the wisdom of Jesus to counter those who have challenged my faith in him. Well, I'll work at it one day at a time. Now, Jesus has just attacked the Pharisees, slapped them across the face, you sinful hypocrites. You judging this woman, and you're just as dirty as she is. He's just shown mercy and grace to this woman, and she is vind vindicated. Vindicated, yep. Vindicated. <clears throat> yeah, as long as she repents. As long as she doesn't go back into that previous lifestyle, she's vindicated. Long as she heeds his warning, obedience, oh, there's that word obedience again. As long as she obeys what Jesus told her to do, she's vindicated. So Jesus has got a crowd. The Pharisees have kind of slithered off into the woodwork in shame and embarrassment. But the rest of the people are standing around. So he addresses a crowd that has just witnessed this confrontation and makes another appeal for them to commit to following him. He references himself as the light of the world. When the Pharisees try to challenge and discredit his testimony, Jesus cites God the Father and even the Mosaic Law as his witnesses. Now he's got his witness, he's got God the Father, he's going to also cite, before we get done, Jesus is going to cite the Law of Moses as a part of his testimony also. That's not just two, that's three witnesses. That's a pretty powerful testimony. That he is who he says he is. We will quickly acknowledge that light triumphs over darkness and is almost always more desirable, especially when we need to see where we're going or what we're doing. Most of the time, well, we like darkness when we're sleeping. It's a little easier to sleep when it's dark. Uh, some people like darkness because they don't want you to see what they're doing. And we think if we do it in the dark, we're less visible and we're getting away with it. God has perfect night vision. <laughs> you may fool me. You may fool others. You may not see anybody see you doing it, but God does see you doing it. 
kind of the people that would uh, cuss around me and they, oh, God, I'm so sorry, I, I, you're a minister. <laughs> they don't have to worry about cussing around me. They have to worry about cussing around God. And God's where I'm not. I think God's where I am also, but uh, it's so funny how we try to, in like manner, knowing Jesus, His way of living and forgiveness of our sin is light in a dark and scary place. Jesus gives us hope and direction. He shows us the way to true happiness and eternal life. He even gives us much evidence to believe in Him. Now, we're two and a half years into Jesus' life, His ministry. About, roughly about six months between here and the cross. And, of course, the apostles have been intently with Jesus for the last year and a half in apostleship training. And so there's a lot of evidence out there that they've seen. They've had more than one opportunity to hear and speak. They've more and more not seen many of uh, most of his miracles. So they have a lot of evidence in which to believe in him. And you and I... We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's testimonies. We've got the testimony of, of the book, uh, book of Acts, Luke's epistle, uh, Luke's writings, uh, talking about the history of the church. We have the testimony of Paul and all of his writings, and the Hebrew writer, and Peter, and James, and, and John, the, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, and, and uh, John, the apostle, and all of these. And then we've got historians that were non-Christian. Josephus was a Jew, but he mentions in his book that Jesus was here on this earth. We look at our calendar system. We've got so much evidence for Jesus. It's like, it doesn't make sense to me how a person can deny him, and yet there are those who don't want to accept the evidence. Some don't want to look at it. How many Jews would become Christians if they would just look at Matthew and Hebrews and judge the prophecies about Jesus by what Matthew and Hebrew tell them about it. Well, in conclusion, if we truly love Jesus, we know that we are sinning and we don't need to be told. Amen. We need to repent of any sin in our lives and live like those who love Jesus. And likewise, we need to use wisdom in confronting others of their sin. Jesus is the light that helps us to walk in the right way. What are the words of Jesus when he was when he talked to Thomas, Doubting Thomas? Mm -hmm. Blessed are those that don't see, yet they believe. That's yeah. us. And so that all of the evidence we got is multitude. We got more evidence than anything else in the world to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. And any other person in existence, I mean, got more evidence to prove him than try to prove any other person, you know. But we weren't there and didn't see him. And yeah. so when he says, talks about those that don't see yet believe, that's pretty big stuff. Our walk with Jesus is very truly on faith. Yeah. Yeah. Well, next week, Jesus is going to continue his challenge to the people who believe in him. And he's going to accuse the Pharisees of being hypocrites because they won't believe in him. Mm -hmm. So this little conversation, uh, we're going to see several encounters with Jesus and the Pharisees now, uh, all the way to the cross. And then they're going to have some shame and uh, uh, humiliation on their face after the cross. Well, it's time to turn over to our discussion questions on page 175 and break up into our discussion groups. And we will uh, pick this up next week. You can follow us and stay in touch with what is happening with the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and watch our video clips on YouTube and GodTube. Getting to Know Jesus is sponsored by New Hope Gospel Ministries. If you'd like to follow along with us and start your Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study group, or just pray for us or support our ministry, you can go to 
gettingtoknowjesus.org and find all the information that we have available for you. If you look at the lower right hand corner, there's a button where you can make a safe and secure donation to the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry. Or you can go to the order page and order your Getting to Know Jesus books for your Bible study group. Thank you for stopping by and keep us in your prayers and let us know how we can pray for you.